This video is a reference video about my growing conditions because I'm getting such fantastic advice in many comments that would work under certain circumstances which I do not have or am trying to avoid implementing for reasons. So, as to not offend anyone that takes the time to comment and give advice on how to grow an orchid, especially rescuing orchids, I'm putting this video out hoping that anyone who watches it will understand why some of the valid advice is not feasible for me. When answering in comments, a lot of information can get lost in translation because it would entail a novel to clarify why I cannot do XYZ or also possibly don't want to try XYZ. So I appreciate that you are here, that you're interested to hear about my growing conditions. I'm going to try and be as comprehensive as possible with temperatures, humidity, growth spaces in the summer and winter, etc. And if you already know all of this because you have been with my channel from Jump, I thank you so much for taking in this information all over again. Yawn, I know. <laughs> Not only are you supporting my channel with a view, hopefully a like, but you have been here for the past three years and I cannot thank you enough for all that you have done for the channel, how you have made me feel accepted and how you have encouraged me, motivated me, made me feel as though I'm helping with my content. Thank you all so, so much. If you're not as familiar with my conditions, this video may be an eye opener because I face challenges that would be considered black and white, yin and yang, but also, if you're not familiar with my conditions, that means that you're new to the channel, that this may be the first video you're watching, maybe wondering whether to subscribe, etc. Well, I hope that you do decide to subscribe because nothing comes easy when it comes to growing orchids in my conditions and it has taught me a lot about how to make things work, what to let go, where my limitations are, and I have lost a lot of orchids in the past two years for many different reasons, but these reasons give me such a broad spectrum of conditions that I can mash up in my head. So I hope you subscribe. My conditions might be mine to deal with, but what I am learning because of them are a benefit to everyone who wants to grow orchids, but feels as though it cannot be done because they don't have the perfect setup. I appreciate you giving me the vote of confidence that I can deliver as an orchid channel, and you subscribing is much appreciated. Thank you. You may have recently subscribed and don't know my conditions to the fullest either because you have seen the videos that were being posted through the winter months. Well, woohoo, cartwheels around the patio. The weather gods are raising the night temperatures enough. It would appear that the orchids can get to glam camping again permanently very soon. This video will give you an insight of what I am anticipating for the growing season and you will hear about what I will face. Because while I am happy that the temperatures are warming up, I am going to be frazzled some days because of what happens on the patio. So we move from being frazzled during the winter months to being frazzled during the coming months of the season. <laughs> and I can promise you, of the two, I prefer being frazzled during the coming months for sure. Anyway, long intro, but I don't want to leave anyone out. All of you that watch the video, subscribe and like are so appreciated. I say it in every video, but many times it may sound like a repeat phrase that is said because it is the right thing to say. But here, I have to tell you that there is more to it than that. They may be words I say every time, but I mean every single word every time. I sometimes get caught up in the YouTube time constraints, not wanting to waste your time and get to the point. So my expression of appreciation slides out quickly and you know, we move on, but I mean every single word. I appreciate you know that, please. Thank you. Here's me speaking of not wanting to waste your time and maybe now you're thinking, hello, you are wasting my time right now. Sorry, I do like to ramble sometimes. It feels more personable when I do. It was selfish of me to ramble, so here goes. <laughs> let's start with my winter conditions. I know that we have just been through that, but let's get the negative out of the way and end with the positive. 
Even though I am in southern Spain, my outdoor winter nights can drop to 5 degrees Celsius from mid-December through end of February. While not all nights go that low, they can be in single digits for several nights in a row, which does not allow the days to warm up. So, during those harsh conditions, my outdoor temperatures will only rise to 14 degrees Celsius if there is sun, Conditions like that come with a wind chill or an overcast day, possibly rain. I rely a lot on warm pockets on my patio to tide orchids over, and during conditions like that, there are no warm pockets. And when I say to tide my orchids over, it means giving them natural light. I overwinter my intermediate warm to hot growing orchids indoors in what used to be a dining room. I do not use heating or artificial lighting anymore. So the harshest temperatures outdoors will not raise any indoor temperatures either, meaning the lowest indoor temperatures that I have to deal with so far have been 14 degrees Celsius. When the sun shines in the winter, I do get a smidgen of natural sunlight coming in deep into the grow space, but it is not there for long maybe 30 minutes and that is not enough for highlight cattleyas or renanthras or angrecoids but it is better than nothing on the coldest days when i have a wind chill all orchids that need to be protected stay inside however if i have sunny days in which i have 16 degrees celsius and sunshine then i have some warmer pockets on the patio and i carry all the orchids outside for as long as the temperatures are favorable then bring them back in again early or late afternoon depending who can handle a little lower temperatures, prioritizing my shuffle on who needs to come in ASAP as dusk hits. I also have a rack that gets moved around the patio according to the season. During the winter months, I have that rack on the west side of the patio because the angle of the sun reaches the top corner faster and it warms up enough for me to bring some orchids out to spend the day there. The west side is also tucked back a little bit, which protects that space from any harsh chills in the air, so that is a valuable pocket of warmth. While the white facade and terracotta are great for light reflection and heating up buckets with water in it to an acceptable temperature. The rack usually moves from the east side to the west side mid-November, or when the night temperatures are consistently too low to have orchids glam camping outdoors permanently. The blooming alley rack stays where it is permanently, shaded by trellising and curtains. It provides a pocket of warmth, sort of, on sunny days. Having an east to west alley orientation, that is why I call it alley, allows for cold winds to zip through, so it has to be a sunny day for orchids to be able to cope with colder wind, while having sun to balance that out. I usually only have the curtains down starting spring, during the winter months, they are up because the sun is much needed in that space. On rainy and overcast days, while indoors, none of my orchids get the high light they need, so photosynthesis is almost non-existent. This is why many of my orchids come out of the winter months with deficiencies. I am super conservative when it comes to fertilizing and supplementing during the winter months because my main focus is on preserving the roots that they do not get taken out by being cold and wet. My humidity levels from mid-December to approximately mid-February are an average of 50%. Nights can go up to 80%, but with cold temperatures as mentioned previously, those are dangerous levels. When it comes to providing airflow, I do open the door of the grow space whenever possible. I try to match the indoor with the outdoor temperatures so that anything in bud won't blast or anything that is up against the door where the opening is won't get blasted with a wind chill. So you may say, well, change your setup to a wet dry cycle, problem solved. And I agree with you on that front. That would solve a big major problem for the winter months very, very quickly. Because just in case you weren't aware, I used to grow a collection of orchids in the 90s in wet dry cycle in clay pots with organic media. But Hear me out, when you understand what the warmer months of the year have to offer here in southern Spain, just give me a second, I'll get there. And please, let me also tell you, these are the best months of the year for me as a person, so while I may sound like I'm stressed about those conditions, I would much rather have those conditions 12 months of the year than the winter conditions. 
The stress of the warmer months of the year, while laborious, I love it. I fear winter. I really, really do. It affects me mentally, compounded by the fact that I cannot do my collection justice. It really gets me down. Going into winter, being courageous, and with bravado, it only lasts for about two weeks. That is when I come out of the fall, the kiddos are indoors, and I feel as though I can do this. But I am pining for that 21st December date when I know the days are set to get longer, whilst slowly, without any obvious change, that date is a milestone for me. Then, the focus switches to staying warm, not succumbing to the dark and cold conditions. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you, but before having to deal with these drastic circumstances, I never noticed how cold southern Spain actually gets during the winter. By mid-February, my humidity drops to 30%. Even though the temperatures are not warming up marginally, if there is no rain, 30% is all I'm getting. But the misting of the mounts and other bare root orchids has already begun because, well, they need their water, but I have to time the misting just right so that no one dries out too fast, while no one can be too wet when dusk settles in and most of the mounts come indoors again. Anywho, as we move into spring, which is where we're at, at the point of narrating this video, again, cartwheels or the patio. <laughs> Anywho, at this time of year, my night temperatures fluctuate between 13 degrees Celsius and 16 degrees Celsius while my day temperatures are evening out at 20 degrees Celsius, resulting in the fact that the warm pockets on my patio are more stable and I can shuffle orchids without having to think who goes where, at what time of day, where do they go, and for how long do they go there, <laughs> starting mid-February, sometimes end of February. By April, I am able to keep the majority of the orchids outside, while previously I would bring some inside depending on their tolerance and others can already stay outside. By mid-April, the night temperatures start to stay consistent, not dropping below 15 degrees Celsius. That is a normal spring for us. The days are anywhere between 23 degrees Celsius and 27 degrees Celsius. And while these temperatures are on a bit of a yo-yo trend, I'm dealing with wind on the patio, sometimes gale force wind that swirls around and raises havoc. And those are the frazzle days. Those days keep me busy. <laughs> In addition to all the racks, I have a part of the patio I call the Deep South, as the last of my vendacious orchids may not have had enough light to harden off. The hangar is in the deep south, which is in perma shade from mid-November through to the end of April-ish. <laughs> so that is where I have the highest humidity because of the hedge, high light because of the reflection of the facade, and I can harden off orchids that have not had that much light exposure for the past four months, in the hopes to not burn leaves when it is time to move everyone outside to the east side of the patio. Usually by mid-April, that is when I happily close the west side for orchid growing business, very happily I can tell you, and move the rack to the east side because now the sun is higher in the sky, the night temperatures are steady, and I do not have to take orchids in and out anymore. The travel distance between the grow space and the east side would also make for a ludicrous shuffle routine. So when that rack moves to the east side, I breathe a sigh of relief. I cannot tell you in the most appropriate words the amount of relief I feel when that rack finally moves to the east side. The orchids then allocated on the east side are high light, high heat orchids, and I have to protect them with a curtain because at this time of year, that corner warms up really quickly. If there is no chill in the wind, but not only that, the orchids are still tender, so while it looks ridiculous, I have the curtain down on that rack until the sun moves around the building, after which I raise the curtain and the orchids can enjoy bright shade, while still experiencing a coolish sort of wind in the shade, but warm enough because of the residual warmth from the terracotta floor. Along the hedge, I have some orchids that have no other space on the patio, and while they could take the full sun, the lack of humidity for cooling their leaves down 
being non-existent makes them very unhappy orchids. The wind does a number on them as well, so when I bought these orchids, I bit off more than I could chew, and unfortunately, while alive, they will never be a great representation of how to grow orchids. They are too large to fit into the blooming alley where it's a little bit more protected, and during the warmest months of the year, the patio, no matter where, is in full sun, so I have resorted to positioning them in such a way where they are least affected by the wind. You wouldn't think it, but that is why they are where they are. Now you may say southern Spain, it gets really hot. And yes, probably, but I prefer to use the term warmest months of the year because I think I have a different heat index. I was so disappointed the summer of 2022. I only had one day where the temperature reached 39 degrees Celsius promptly, since some orchids on that day, but for me, that is just about reaching the temperature where I could say it's nice and hot. If I'm still wearing black in August, that means that I am choosing that color because it absorbs the heat and I wanted to feel some heat. Last summer, I wore black throughout the whole summer. I never really felt hot. Anyway, my summer temperatures range from 25 degrees Celsius nights to 40 degrees Celsius days, sometimes higher but not relevant enough to mention as a margin and my humidity can drop even further down to 15 or 20 percent added to that warm winds most of the time and absolutely no rain that is when i can get a little frazzled again because i'm chasing the orchids with the mister just to keep them cool I'm thinking that 2023 won't be so bad because I don't have to worry about any more large vandas. So things may turn out to be a little less stressful, but still, keeping the orchids cool is something I thoroughly enjoy doing. And I look like a plucked chicken during those days, but I feel wonderful. <laughs> I can work with those conditions, be liberal in those conditions, help my orchids in those conditions, none of which is true during the winter. So you see the reasoning for my setup of Lekka and self-watering. I grow in Lekka and self-watering because eight months of the year are the majority months where this setup works, whereas the remaining four months of the year, it's a huge gamble for orchids that do not like cold, wet roots. Because of the harsher summer conditions, it is the better choice of setup and then tiptoe to the best of my ability around the conditions that take orchids out during the winter and tide them over as best as possible, just attempting to bring them through the other side. And not only that, just to mention the economic benefit of growing in inorganic media. It is a lifesaver when it comes to the cost of growing orchids. And speaking of costs, that is why I rarely use sphagnum moss anymore. Because hopefully after explaining the majority of this, you can understand the amount of misting I have to do to keep mounted orchids happy and watered and not turn into oregano because moss may dry out too fast. The moss deteriorates in my conditions doing what I have to do within six months of being freshly changed, meaning... I used to have to change my moss out two times per year and one of those time periods was when there was no active root growth, usually heading into fall. That is not ideal for orchids and it got expensive on the purchasing moss front. And I won't even address the algae accumulation, that was an unpleasant side effect, but the other two factors played a major role as to why I do not use sphagnum moss on mounts anymore. The main one of those being, I hated messing with a root system that was not an act of growth. Heading into a season that was going to be complicado for me, and yeah, anyway, I think you understand where I'm coming from. So, I briefly mentioned fall. Well, I can leave my orchids to their glam camping usually until the end of October. While some come indoors, the east rack orchids fill the blooming alley and from there the reverse shuffle starts the same way as in early spring. Then the rack gets moved back to the west in preparation for another nail-biting, anxiety-inducing winter. Yuck! A quick note about my deep south. That is the home of my angrecoids from mid-April approximately to mid-October or when the night temperatures drop below 15 degrees Celsius. The terracotta heats that area nicely during the fall 
one night I was shocked to see the temperatures drop lower than that out of the blue, not forecasted, and I put a woolly blanket into the hedge and protected them for one night, which worked great, <laughs> but usually as night temperatures dropping to 15 degrees Celsius, the engraicoids come inside. My deep south is also the area with the highest little microclimate of humidity that I have around the patio. So yeah, it's kind of prime locations for those engrecoids and I absolutely love having them outside. We are so close to getting those beauties out of their winter confinement. So, so close and I cannot wait. It is one of the funnest days of my end of winter shuffle. I love bringing my engrecoids outside, opening up the deep south for growing business. These orchids do not deserve to be cooped up in a space that does not provide the light they crave. The fresh air around them all the time. When I get to bring them out and open up the deep south, I feel as though I'm releasing a rescued animal back into the wild when I open the deep south and have them outside again. It is such a special day and well, that video will come out at some point because while it is the same old, same old, it is what happens on the patio and they get their moment in the spotlight after coming through the winter with me. I am so, so looking forward to that day. <laughs> Woohoo! Coming soon! <laughs> I think I have pretty much covered everything. I hope that this video gave everyone a great insight as to what I try and do for my orchids. Why I cannot take some advice because of my conditions not being normal. They are not controlled. The grow space is a raw holding area that changes depending on what conditions I'm dealing with on the daily and the patio the same thing. While not a holding area, it is not steady. It is not a greenhouse. And for that reason, when I read such great advice, I know exactly that it would work if only I could make it work where I'm at. But my circumstances dictate what I can or cannot do or what I know won't work even with all the best intentions. Let me know if you have any questions about any area if I missed a detail. If you think that I can tweak something to improve things that do not cost money. I am in no position to spend money on anything when it comes to upgrading something, for example, misters. Speaking of which, the water I use is RO water. My mains water is toxic for my orchids and if I were to have misters installed for the summer months, then that would mean a whole infrastructure of sorts requiring reverse osmosis water. I cannot afford that. Even if I were able to concoct something on my own, it would still cost money to buy the supplies. I am growing orchids low cost. No investment into anything. If I were to purchase anything, the limited budget that I have is allocated for necessary pots, fertilizer, supplement, seaweed, nothing extravagant, the bare minimum. And while I'm unemployed, I am the best mister my orchids will ever have, trust me. <laughs> so yeah, low budget production here. But if you would like to support the channel, would like to support the orchids and my intentions here, please like the video, please subscribe, keep the interaction going with the channel by commenting, sharing the videos, giving the channel access to a broader audience and please watch the ads. These gestures are so appreciated and every little helps to get my channel out there to a bigger, broader audience that will hopefully also enjoy the content. If you want to go a step further, YouTube offers so many tools to help a channel, which would then help my orchids. There is also the thanks button under each video where you can contribute to supporting the orchids by leaving a tip, or you can join my membership. You can become an orchid ninja for a monthly subscription. That's a massive support to the orchids. I would also love to see you with a bloom and a ninja emoji behind your name. I mean, it's just cute. <laughs> and with all of that being said, roll on the grow season of 2023. I am up for it. The orchids are up for it. I'm ready for it. I know my orchids are more than ready for it. And personally, I feel like a racehorse chomping at the bits, waiting for the gates to open and let's go. Let's grow. Thank you so much once again for all you do for the channel. Thank you for watching or listening in this case. Have yourself a fabulous day. I do add a condition to that though, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.